everybody. Uh, it's great to see everybody. I'm particularly excited to uh, see Megan and also some of my uh, uh, garden club friends that um, love this topic. So uh, welcome aboard. And uh, tonight I'd like to introduce you, uh, uh, by the way, I'm Winnie Frost and my co-chair is Bill. Dink, he's right there. Okay, great. And uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Megan McKinty tonight for her program on the value of native plants. Um, she herself lives here, right here in Great Falls. And she loves, has a great passion for the native, native plants and their aesthetics, healing nature and ecological value. And uh, beyond that, I'm not gonna say anything because I'm gonna let her talk. Go for it, Megan. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is my first time doing this, Zoom and presentation, so I am a little nervous, but the opportunity to speak with this audience is actually something I've been dreaming about for years. Um, I know that the Environmental Park Committee has done a lot to conserve resources here in Great Falls, and so I'm very grateful, and I'm very honored to be here. Um, I also know that many of you have been planting and living here for decades. Um, and I was hoping to open this up to input later on in the talk. Um, hopefully we can manage that, uh, keeping in mind with the recording. I really feel like I have a lot to learn um, from all of you. So thank you again for having me. Um, I'm mostly gonna speak on the topics this evening that the committee requested. Um, I do encourage questions at the end. Um, I didn't plan a very long talk. So like I said, I'm really hoping to get into some questions um, and, and sharing of experience when it comes to specific native plants. Um, the presentation is gonna cover protected areas, uh, native plants that do so much for us. We ask a lot of them and they really do perform for us. And then also how to learn more and how to get started gardening with native plants. Um, so I'm supposed to have a PowerPoint up somewhere. And I, there it is. It's happening. It's happening. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm not in charge of my own technology today, but I am very appreciative that someone is managing this, Jennifer. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so can I control my own slides or do I have to tell you? Actually, I'm going to control it for you. I apologize. I should, we should have done this in a slightly different manner, but I'm just gonna scroll to the next page if that's all right with you. Yes, so I'm on slide. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So there's something I did want to share. I, I purchased my property in 2013. So I've been living in Great Falls um, since uh, for seven years. And this is a photo from my um, native plant garden, which is actually only three years old. So I wanted to take this opportunity to share a little bit about my experience of gardening with native plants in Great Falls. Uh, the first few years I owned the property, um, I wasn't really, I had two little kids. So I was taking care of babies. But once I had some room and opportunity, I started converting our lawn around our outdoor living space into a native plant garden. Um, if you wanna know more about that specific process of converting lawn, I'm happy to talk to you about that at the presentation. Um, but the reason I bring this up was, um, it really was a transformation from a seemingly um, lifeless lawn to what is now buzzing with bumblebees and butterflies and songbirds. We had songbirds nesting this year. Um, the soil has been greatly improved. The beneficial insects have come in um, and the, I don't, I'm not having pest problems. It's really been an amazing transformation in just three years. Um, and I think the most impressive thing for me has really been the diversity of butterflies. Um, this here is an Eastern tiger swallowtail on my great blue lobelia. Um, and as many of you know, this is the host plant uh, for the caterpillar of the species is actually the tulip poplar, which we have a lot of in this area. Um, so I wanted to bring that up. We ma actually made several changes in our property, um, including stopping using a pesticides, adding uh, bird baths, um, getting rid of other invasive plants to get a wild and participate in the wildlife sanctuary program. So many of you may be familiar with the Audubon at Home. 
Thank you, Jennifer. So this is actually a campaign. Plant Nova Natives is a campaign um, just promoting native plants. Um, it is spearheaded by Margaret Fisher, and she has successfully organized various uh, businesses, organizations, volunteers. Um, I really encourage you to visit this website. It has plants for butterflies, plants for hummingbirds. It has instructional videos. And specifically this week, they're actually holding conveniently enough two different um, video conferences where they're going to help individuals uh, with their native problem, excuse me, native plant challenges. So personalized, personalized um, expert opinion. So that's really helpful. Please check out that website. Next episode, uh, next episode. Ooh. Next slide, please. Having a little technical difficulty, I apologize. Not a problem, not a problem. The next slide is gonna talk about uh, resource protection areas, which is something um, since this committee is involved in uh, stormwater management, um, people are probably very familiar with. Um, it's at the county level, every stream or water uh, pond, lake should have a hundred feet native plant buffer around that water source. Um, the goal, uh, according to the county, is to remove pollutants from the stormwater runoff. Um, what I thought was very interesting is you can figure out where your property is related to the nearest resource protection area. So if you can go to the next slide, I uh, pulled it up for my particular property. I'm actually up on a, a small hill um, in between two different watersheds. Great, excellent. So. The county actually has a website where you can type in your address and it'll tell you exactly where you are. Um, so my particular property is in between two watersheds, the Nicole Run and the Pond Branch. A property is atop a hilltop, it's a uh, flat. I don't have any streams, I don't have any shaded area, it's an old horse farm, um, but I do see my property as a stepping stone. I think it's important to see that there are uh, resource protection areas on either side of our property, and I really do feel that every property, whether or not you have a resource protection area, um, if you're expanding one or if you're a stepping stone like a property of mine, I really do feel that all properties can contribute to a healthy landscape. So one of the other things um, that the committee was looking for was specific plants. Now this is, I was kind of hoping to open this up um, to see if anyone have experience with these specific plants. Um, that being said, reducing erosion, that's oftentimes what we're looking for along streams. Resist deer browsing. You know, I had no idea what deer browsing was like until I moved to Great Falls. It, it's truly astounding um, the level of browsing consistently throughout the year, not to mention their, um, the antlers, the rubbing against the trunks. Um, so some of these uh, plants, these perennials and ferns here um, will resist the deer browsing. They have year round foliage and they tolerate a range of conditions. I mean, this is really a great set of plants um, that it's very hard to meet all those attributes in one. Um, I would like to go through each one um, the Christmas fern and the marginal wood fern um, are the only two ferns that we have that are evergreen that are, are really resist that deer browsing. And they do both spread underground uh, with rhizomes. So they're really great for stabilizing erosion. Um, horse till does need more water. Um, it is definitely something that's gonna want moister conditions. Um, whereas the robin's plantain could probably uh, withstand a little bit more sun, a little bit more uh, dry soil. Um, my experience with robin's plantain though is it spreads wonderfully. I had a great performance this year in a hot dry spot um, and it spreads. So I think it could work really well for erosion control. Um, the partridge berry, I'm sure many of you have seen hiking. Um, it grows on slopes at the base of trees. It's very slow growing, um, but it is a beautiful evergreen that deers do not munch on. Um, it likes moist soil, but it does definitely uh, withstand drier conditions. The lyre leaf sage I had experience with this year, it reseeds. It reseeds and naturalizes really, really well. And although its leaves get a little withered in the winter with the cold, it has this great bronze kind of purplish green foliage that's there all year. Um, and its flower spikes even stick around. So even the flowers go on, you get this nice um, height, you know? So as it, it's spreading around, you don't just get the ground cover, you actually get a little bit of height. 
Um, and the foam flower, many people are, are familiar with the foam flower. I do really think that the, the Tyrella cordifolia is an excellent um, choice for erosion control. Again, it's like the lyre leaf sage in the sense that it does get a little wilted in the winter, but it hangs in there. Um, I would, yes, great, thank you so much. So if we're willing to let go of having year round foliage, um, we get into some more plants here. Um, Many of you might be familiar with sedges. Sedges spread clumping. They do a great job with erosion control and are tolerant of shade. A lot of these areas along streams where we're trying to control erosion are heavily shaded. Um, hokura is also something that probably are, people are more familiar with. Jack in the pulpit. Um, I personally have never been able to grow it. It does not like the hard clay soils that I have. Um, it definitely likes more loamy soils, but it is so low maintenance once it gets established. It does a great job at spreading. Um, button bush is gonna like things a little bit moister. Um, sorry, I was, yep, thank you. <laughs> uh, and now this is, the button bush is a, is a large uh, bush and it also is a great um, wildlife plant. Um, golden ragwort, we're probably used to seeing in, in parks like Seneca and River Bend down by the river. It likes the moisture to wet sites, um, but it will form these beautiful carpets, um, which would do really well to control um, uh, erosion. The wild ginger is interesting. All the, all the resources say, you know, they need moist soil. I have found wild ginger does great in drier soils, as long as they're not getting a hot afternoon sun. Um, I think the wild ginger does really well uh, in drier soils. Whereas the green and gold, um, you know, the amazing thing about green and gold is they flower in deep shade. That's, that's a really unique phenomenon. And um, they do like it on the moisture side though. Um, I absolutely love seeing Jack in the pulpit. If you can grow Jack in the pulpit, let me know because I would love to maybe pick up some bulbs. So um, native plants that reduce erosion, reduce deer browsing, but are sun tolerant. Okay, you get a lot of grasses here. Now, I encourage you to visit, um, Fairfax County actually has a website, Plants That Reduce Erosion. They give a lot of great examples um, and they'll list some specific species of grasses that'll do really well. Make sure um, you know, that we get native grasses when we're working in these uh, protected areas. Um, pawpaw, I'm not, I'm not sure if anyone has any experience with that. As far as I understand, it only can really tolerate sandy soils. So it would do great if you have a nice sandy riverbank, stream bank that you're looking to control erosion with. Um, nine bark also is going to be a tree or shrub, get pretty tall. Uh, the bee balm is another great plant for butterflies, but it'll spread. I discovered this year, every node that touches the ground roots in. So it definitely will make its um, make itself comfortable in a place. Uh, obedient plant, you know, everyone knows is actually the disobedient plant. It will definitely spread and take over an area. Um, and then common verbena. Now these are just plants, you know, there's a lot more on these lists. I found these lists again through the Fairfax County uh, website, uh, Plants for Erosion Control. But then I also cross-referenced it with um, Plant Nova Natives, the website I mentioned earlier, the campaign, they actually have a whole list of uh, deer resistant plants. It's an amazing database. I highly recommend you take a look at it. They give you details in height, um, what type of soil. It's a really great list. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next, thank you. So um, what I have grown um, in my garden, cause I don't have a lot of erosion issues um, or have a stream for that matter has been a habitat garden. I really wanted to focus on um, perennials and trees and shrubs that attracted songbirds, that attracted butterflies. Um, another thing I wanna point out, you know, if, if you build it, they will come. I mean, that's really what I have found. If you plant the plants for the nectar, if you plant the plants for the caterpillars, they will come. And I'm sure many of you have had that experience. Um, you know, what I didn't really expect was, you know, so would all the other insects and then the songbirds and then the hawks and then the toads and the skinks, you know? So once you really build this native plant community, um, it really takes off. Um, I have found my kids love playing it in it. Um, I have people come over and they said they just love the feel of, of the garden. And I, and I really think that there's something to be said for that. Um, so I'm going to get a little bit into some of the sp specific, excuse me. Um, I was asked to talk about um, specifically monarchs. So bringing monarchs into the garden. Um, an essential, of course, is common milkweed. Um, I've had a hard time getting established in my garden, but apparently it's a weed. So everyone has different uh, soils and, and situations. Um, but I do get monarch butterflies on another Asclepius, the Squamp Asclepius. 
Um, but it's not as juicy of a leaf I have found. Um, so I just want to go through here real quick, um, looking at um, different dry environments versus moist environments. We do mostly see butterflies in the sun. And I know that's hard for a lot of people who have properties with a lot of shade. It's really hard to bring in those butterflies. Um, but most of the nectar plants that you're going to see are sun plants. Um, I don't want to bore people. I know I went through that whole list, but I'm worried that I don't want to overwhelm people with too much information about a lot of these plants. I will just highlight that um, this year with the Vernonia glauca, the broad-leaved ironweed, was a spectacular performer in my garden this year. It just bloomed profusively, attracted so many different types of uh, butterflies. Once it's seeded, I had goldfinches and blue, and all kinds of songbirds coming to eat the seeds. Um, but I will say it reseeds like no problem. I mean, it is definitely everywhere. So that's one of the things we got to think about when we bring these plants into our gardens. We either need to be willing to let things establish. We need to be willing to go out and weed out the natives that um, do so well in our gardens or have, a, have an experienced gardener. That is something to keep in mind. The other one that I absolutely love this year was the downy skullcap, the scutellary in Kana. I never had that in my garden. Um, this was the first year that it actually flowered and it was beautiful. I mean, it gets these light blue blooms and you know, it bloomed for a little while and it fell over. And I thought, well, that's too bad. It didn't bloom very long, but then from every lateral shoot, it shot up and bloomed all over again. It was, and the butterflies loved it. The bumblebees loved it. It was really, it was a very enjoyable plant. Um, I do want to make a comment about the common bonnet down here, the Eupatorium perfilodium, perfil this one was a volunteer in my garden this year and it looked so weedy when I saw it. But I said, you know what, I'm gonna let it develop. Let's see what happens. Let's see what it develops into. And one day I caught a monarch on it. So just a lesson. Sometimes it's good to let the weeds grow in our garden and see what they become. Um, this monarch was very happy. Um, it does say, you know, the resources said moist, but I would say that area was slightly dry. It just had a little bit of shade in it. Um, if we can go to the next uh, slide here. So these are all butterflies from my garden. Um, this is that very monarch on that common bonnet. Um, we get lots of the Eastern American, uh, excuse me, the Eastern tiger swallowtails in our garden. They love the Vernonia this year, the uh, broadleaf ironweed. And then on the bottom there is a, the picture of the hoary skullcap with a little skipper on there. Um, I'm hoping in the in the springtime to open my garden to visitors. I've got lots of signs in my garden. It was always intended to be something that people should come and visit and learn from. Um, so hopefully in the springtime, uh, everything will be coming up and we'll all be out and about more often. I definitely want to open that up. Um, if you can go ahead and go to the next slide. <clears throat> we were also, or excuse me, the committee actually asked me to ask about, excuse me, to speak about hummingbirds. But this was actually one of the topics I was hoping to ask individuals in the audience about. Um, most of the plants that I know I've listed here, the Eastern Red Columbine and the Honeysuckle, the Scarlet Bee Balm and the Cardinal Flower. Now all of these, you know, need a lot of sun. I don't know if anyone's had any experience um, growing any flowers in the shade for hummingbirds. Um, but before I open up um, here for a little bit of input, one of the things I did want to highlight was for hummingbirds, they just use the nectar for sugar, right? They just use the nectar for their energy. It's like their coffee or their apple, whatever gets you going in the day. But they actually eat as insects. So just as important as offering nectar plants in the garden is also plants that are hosting a balance of insects. We don't want pests. We don't want, you know, we want a balance of beneficial and um, what we consider pests. And in those environments, we can also provide food for um, the hummingbirds. So um, Jennifer, I don't know if it's possible to open it up for some comments. If anyone has any comments up to date on any specific native plants that I've mentioned so far, or more specifically on um, gardening for hummingbirds. Is everybody awake? I know, right? <laughs> and put your uh, off mute. I guess everybody's off mute. So, Megan, uh, I'll just tell you, Megan, Megan I yeah. just mentioned to you, I uh, planted some uh, Jack in the Pulpit pulpits from uh, a woodland place a number of years ago, and they uh, are propagating. So, um, next <clears throat> spring, I'll get you a few uh, Jack in the Pulpits. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate that. As you asked. Excellent. And and Bill will do that. Great. He'll be over there. And I, I think that and, would be a great And if anyone needs redbud trees, 
I have lots of little red bud trees and I love to give them away to somebody who wants a red bud tree. So uh, mm -hmm. let me know if you want a red bud tree even now because I've got too many. You know, Bill, you actually fell right into what was going to be my next step was I think that trading native plants amongst neighbors is one of the best ways to get started with native plants. It's cost free. You get to meet other people that are have experience with native plants. So thank you for that. That was an excellent segue. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is true. And, th and then you can think about, you know, that person when you look at the tree. <laughs> so yeah. Maybe this is maybe this is where Hugh Morrow should speak up about the uh, for native tree, tree native plant sale. What, Bill? You're giving my thunder away. For nah, thank you, thank you, Bill, for the yeah. lead in. <laughs> you, you'll get your well, drink at a later date. Right yeah, every uh, for about the last fifteen years, we have had a native plant sale. Usually, the last Saturday in April or the first Saturday in May. And we have, we usually sell anywhere between 800 to 1,000 native plants. And we have anywhere between 30 and 40 different species. And almost all of the species that uh, uh, Megan was mentioning, we have on sale. And, you know, it is very well attended. Uh, we make a lot of money on the sale. It's a great opportunity to, to come by. This, this year, we didn't do as well because of COVID and the park was closed down, but we still managed to sell uh, more than 800 plants by uh, online. Uh, and, people, and Eleanor Anderson, who most of you know, uh, went around and delivered all the plants to everybody. So it, it, it worked out very well and we are very happy with it. And we, we uh, really, uh, uh, back the sale of native plants and you know I have at least a dozen different species in my backyard and they all take off and yes I do get hummingbirds and butterflies all over the place and and they come back and they grow. I, the eastern wood poppies have taken over all the uh, what I used to have iris beds in my backyard and now they're all <laughs> oh, the golden wood poppies but <laughs> what can you do? Anyhow, we uh, in late April, early May, we have a big sale on, and you know I'll be sending a notice around for that. And also, I think uh, Eleanor was asking me to emphasize that you start your uh, pre-ordering in uh, mid January, and <laughs> she's make sure you say that when you the pre-ordering, and uh, then uh, uh, turns out a lot of people pick up their stuff on Fridays even before they start the, the, let the sale oh, on yes, Saturday. Yeah. We, we yeah. start the pre-ordering process generally around January 15th. We put it online on our, on our website with a list of all the plants as the, uh, uh, you know, the soil and the shade uh, conditions and so forth. Uh, and you can then go ahead and choose what you want. And then we pick them up in April or May. When, uh, when everything, when we get the delivery from the nursery. Wonderful. Well, thank and you. And I know that, that, I know, and I know that Sarah has, has bought some from us. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm here at Turner Farm and we had so many beautiful plants that Jennifer brought by and we had lovely flowers and butterflies, milkweed, everything grew really well. And I'm very pleased with it. And it's all right in the front near the sign that says that we're the curators at Turner. So Good. It's uh, all the Park Authority loves it. Great. <laughs> um, this is Lindine, and I had a, a very uh, I have a specific question. Um, last year, someone from this committee, um, who unfortunately can't be on the committee anymore, did a, a program where they were coordinating with landscapers and um, people who are working on lawns here. So a lot of issues that we have are, you know, we get invasive species because they come in on the blades from the from the um, mowers, from the landscapers. And she did a lot of work to try to talk to them about pesticide use. I was wondering whether it's worth trying to market to them or get them engaged in the purchase of um, native plants as part of that process. I don't really, I mean, I haven't talked to Bill or Bill about this at all, but, um, or Winnie, but it occurred to me as I was listening to you that you know, a lot of the time people engage these guys to come in and do their planting, but they, 
they seek advice from them about what to plant. And so much of what gets planted is stuff that is non-native and isn't resistant to invasive species. I'm wondering if we would make any progress as a committee if we try to do an outreach and what's what's reasonably possible in that way. I will say um, that the plant uh, plant nova natives um, agrees with you and has been trying to reach out to landscape designers in the area. They've worked with some nurseries, including Meadow Farms, about labeling the plants, but I think you're absolutely right. I think that starting with kind of the source of all these new developments or new homes that have this opportunity to have a fresh look on what a garden or a landscape looks like is a great place to start. And um, I would definitely visit the Plant Nova Natives website and see the landscape contractors that they're in touch with. Um, but if the you know Environmental and Parks Committee uh, wanted to work with some of the local landscapers here, I think that's an excellent idea. I agree. Well, this is where Chris might want to jump in about <laughs> dealing with our whole fertilizer problem and our contractors that uh, work with all of our communities on you know maintaining our perfectly landscaped gardens. Is Chris still out there? I am. I am, Winnie. Um, and and there he is. I'm putting him on the spot. Oh dear. Yeah, no, no. I think working with our local uh, landscapers and the contractors, I mean, I feel like I'm one of the only guys in Great Falls who mows his own lawn. Oh, you got. Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. I stopped mowing no my lawn. Is. I forgot. I stopped mowing my lawn. <laughs> 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 but no, seriously, I, you know, I, it, we were looking at it in terms of the fertilizer issue on, on uh, in the runoff of fertilizer and pesticides. But beyond that, I think the other point being made is an excellent one. Why not educate and work with some of the contractors if we could on it? Because if they're making recommendations, I mean, everybody wants to plant azaleas or how come my rhododendrons aren't doing so well? And people want to plant traditional um, what's the term? I forgot it. You know, base plantings around their homes and so forth. And they want a traditional lawn. So if there are ways that we can talk to them and suggest, and maybe there are other, there are alternatives. I, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, the, the landscape industry is a big beast, you know, and whether or not we start with, you know, a single company or whatnot, I, I do think it's a, it's a good avenue to take. Um, I also do think, like I said, in my experience, I really do think that every garden, every native plant, every little, you know, square that we can do matters for us, you know, in the sense of in the meanwhile, I do think the landscape companies, that industry is really big to take on. Um, I guess I was wondering, someone had mentioned about they have successful growing hummingbirds. I'm curious what kind of plants people are growing for hummingbirds specifically. Uh, I, I've yeah. had good, good experience uh, with my hummingbird feeder. Oh. Um, I, when we bought this property, there's about 30 uh, butterfly bushes on the property. So we have a traverse of uh, butterflies going back and forth. I planted some other flowers I bought that supposedly attract butterflies, never seen a butterfly on it. Um, but uh, they do seem interested in uh, some of the sedum, sedum sometimes. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we've, we have maybe one or two monarchs the past two years, that's it. The, the other thing, I've let the milkweed grow when it pops up, but I have seen absolutely no interest by butterflies and milkweed, so I don't know what the story is there. But Can I add, just clarify really quick, what was the first thing you said? You had a bunch of butterfly... Bushes, on your butterfly bushes. Butterfly bushes. Okay, I do want to take a, a moment um, to mention um, butterfly bushes is, is a perfect example leading from what we were just talking about, about common native, uh, excuse me, common, common landscape plants. So the butterfly bush is very widely planted. In fact, recently just in Great Falls Village, they put in some new landscaping and there was a beautiful butterfly bush. Um, unfortunately, the butterfly bush, it provides somewhat of a vacuous or a non-nutritive um, sugar source for the butterflies. And it's also quite invasive. So 
I see it a lot and I think it's very common. It's beautiful and it definitely attracts a lot of butterflies. Um, but in the context of speaking about native plants, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that butterfly bush is actually quite, quite problematic. And I wonder if you planted more natives and didn't necessarily have the butterfly bush, if you would see a, a bigger diversity or them actually using the native plants, potentially. Well, if, if the native plants are truly, truly, truly deer resistant, <laughs> Uh, I might be interested. That's um, a very good point. You know, and honestly, I don't have a single. This, this I don't is have our a problem. This is our number, number one problem. Yeah. I understand that, and honestly, that's that is my. I don't have a single one that's not outside of fence. So I, when I first moved here, I didn't understand the large lawns. Now I understand <laughs> the large lawns. I mean, well, it's, it's it's serious. So. It's either fenced or like I said, you know, there are deer resistant plants. I do recommend, um, like I said, there's several references, but specifically the Plant Nova Natives deer resistant list. That mm -hmm. being said, every deer is different and things that they say are deer resistant, I've known deer to eat. So I understand that is a, a very serious problem. Yeah, and the, uh, you know, the, the butterfly bush is not touched by the deer. Nor, right, I know. It's it's I understand completely. Nor nor is my 15 foot tall winter hardy banana plant. Oh, uh, I knew he was gonna go there with that banana plant. <laughs> but, I love it. I love it. Much, you know, no other uh I have been online with the uh with the uh, hummingbird people and haven't got a good answer. No. You know, you say uh, the nutritive value of the butterfly yeah. bush. Right. I'm not sure what the value of the butter of the hummingbird feeders are either. They're not. They're not. So, you know, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, that's what. So, uh, wait a minute. You're you're freaking me out now. <laughs> the value of the hummingbird feeders are nothing. It's a human value. You get to see them. <laughs> I mean, there's value in the sense that Whoa, there's this aesthetic value. There's aesthetic over value. That one. <laughs> yes. There's a huge aesthetic value. I mean, I think that, you know, supporting, there's actually a lot of research showing that um, it hummingbirds what you put in them. It depends what, what you put in them. It depends what you put in them, right? Well, that's true. That is very <laughs> true. There's a lot of different things you could have in one. I mean, I'm not it's saying that it doesn't sarcastic. exist them. Um, but I do think that, you know, having natives and then you have the, the, the nice thing about the natives is that you get the pollination, right? So that's the change, right? The hummingbirds come to get their nectar and the plants get pollinated. So the idea is that you have to have enough natives, then everything's getting pollinated and getting the, the, the nutrients and the sugars they need. That being said, I'm not against feeders. I have bird feeders. I don't have hummingbird feeders, but I definitely have sunflower seeds out there for my lovely songbirds who I've fallen deeply in love with, all of them. <laughs> so I understand the feeders. I understand. Megan, what, what street are you on? I'm, I'm actually on Down Patrick Lane. So I'm oh, right okay. off of uh, Springvale. Yep. All right, got it. Yep. Oh, you're right down the street from me, Megan. Right by the French restaurant. That's what I tell everyone. <laughs> well, I'm at the corner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Oh, wow. I, oh, no, at the corner of Georgetown and Springvale. Yes. Oh, I oh see. my goodness. Do you well, make house visits? Do I make what? House visits. You know, honestly, I would love to help people plant native plants. No question. Um, you know, it's interesting because I think one of the things that get brought up when um, someone brought up the, the landscaping, you know, we're used to very manicured, I say we as a, as a society, used to a very manicured landscape. That's what we like. We like the fresh mulch. We like right. the trees. That's what we've seen. And to be honest with you, you know, my experience with native plants is it's a little wild. It's a little jungly. I spent a lot of time out there. So it's almost like two different types of gardening that we're talking about. And that's not to say that native plants don't have a place in manicured environments, but I do think that if we're talking about native gardens, I do think there needs to be, it's, it's, a, it's a whole shift in a paradigm almost. And as individuals, I think the more and more that we see gardens that look nice, that have these natives or, you know, visit each other's or swap plants, I think that's really that kind of grassroots way it can make a really big impact. So yes. <laughs> so Megan, yes. if I could ask a question. Yes. You mentioned that um, you were going to talk about how to convert a lawn into a meadow, I guess. And I'm really interested in that. Um, I live in a neighborhood down by the post office and all of us have big lawns, like a half an acre to an acre large lawns. 
And, um, and I've been thinking about converting our back lawn into a uh, more native type of meadow. But I think that it's not an easy project to do. And so I wonder if you will be speaking a little bit about that or um, you know, how we could get more information about how to do that. This is a great time. Um, I, I, I wanted to leave this open. My last couple of slides are really about how to move forward and we can certainly visit those, but I'm happy to talk about it now. Um, I think that transitioning your lawn into a native plant garden is laborious. And you definitely need a lot of patience, but it actually happened much more efficiently um, and was much more rewarding than I ever would have imagined. So it, it's, it's worth it. So I used two main um, methods. One was cardboard mulching. So plant the plants, I planted the shrubs and the trees the first year, um, the big ones, and all around that I laid down cardboard right on top of the grass. And then a very thick, like two inch layer of mulch. So the, the benefit of this strategy is now everything underneath there is gonna decompose and you have a great thick layer of organic matter. So when you go plant next spring or next fall, now you have earthworms, now you have some organic matter, you've got some black soil. So that's one of the strategies I use. That's really the one I advocate for. It is very time consuming and it does take a few years to establish and it does require a lot of cardboard. Mm -hmm. Now, the second strategy I used, um, I, I have a sod remover. It was like a handheld sod remover. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. Um, but I went ahead and rented a, it looks like it's from the 1920s, but it's a push sod remover. So it has two handles. It almost looks like a plow and for 20 bucks, you can push this thing along. I don't know if anyone has experience with this and it takes out whole rolls of sod. Mm -hmm. And then what I did, a non-native, but I seeded with trifolium ripens, white clover. And mm -hmm. I did that because it's a cover crop. I was looking to build my soil. I didn't wanna leave my soil bare and I didn't have the money or the time to plant the natives that I wanted right away, but I wanted to stop having lawn. Mm -hmm. So I don't recommend necessarily going that route because, you know, the clover is not a native, the clover is considered, you know, it definitely takes over. Um, and so you need to be willing to go back. I spend a lot of time now then removing the clover as I'm planting. Um, but I will say that the soil is fabulous. I have huge earthworms, you know, I can see the nodules on the clovers, you know, so those are the two strategies I use. And something else I would say is that, you know, willing to not plant everything the first year, mm -hmm. get your shrubs and trees established. Then next year you come in with some perennials, you know, and one of the things, at least for me, I didn't want to spend a bunch of money up front. Once things get established, they will then start reseeding themselves and, 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 and do it for free. So yeah, that's my summary. Is crimson clover all useful? You know, that's interesting. I, I, when, I, when I looked into the clover option, I looked into a few different um, options and I decided to get the white clover because it was shorter. So the crimson clover, as far as I understand, ha still has that same nitrogen fixing cover crop function, but they just tend to get a little bit taller a little bit more leggy. Yeah. We, I, I put some down actually a few weeks ago and it's already coming up, Yes. but I'm trying it out as a cover crop for a garden patch. Okay. Because I heard that the bees like it and, and we're beekeepers. So oh, I, wonderful. And, and that's the reason to have the meadow because I would yeah. love our bees to have more um, flowers to, yeah. to feed on. Yeah. So I will say one thing that I thought, so I have a back corner of our property, we have five acres in the back acre. I decided to stop mowing and we're going to restore the meadow in the forest. And so I had this dream. I was going to buy wildflower seeds and I was going to throw them in the meadow and there was going to be wildflowers that no. So, you know, I stopped mowing and it was just thick invasive plants. I mean, so dense, so thick. And so what I started doing actually, so the squirrels love to bury acorns and black walnuts in my native plant garden because it's nice and soft and it just seems like a great place. So I have seedlings, oaks. Um, I even had a tulip tree come up. Of course, that's not, that's more of a windblown species. And then what I did was I dug those up and I stuck them out. I dug a little, you know, cleared a little space, but I mean, I did the whole thing. I amended the soil, I mulched them and then I put a deer cage on top of it. So now in that meadow, even though it's filled with invasive plants, I have walnuts growing, I have oaks growing, I planted a couple red buds. Um, so you can kind of jumpstart that restoration process. Um, but at least for me, throwing out wild seeds was 
did not work for me. <laughs> nothing, nothing germinated. <laughs> you know, in our case, um, and we are surrounded by lawns yeah. really on all sides, but um, uh, I've noticed that since we haven't been um, using chemicals for our lawn to make it better, like our neighbors do, um, we have a lot of stilt grass instead of grass, which is an invasive, right? It's probably worse than grass. It looks pretty. Yeah. So, but, but we haven't maintained our lawn thinking that we will be converting it to a meadow eventually. So it's a really tough stop, you know, and I really admire you for taking that on. I think converting a lawn to a meadow, you know, on a larger, you know, larger scale, even a half acre scale is really challenging. Um, it was recommended to me at one time um, to um, mow several times and, you know, basically trying to get those three years in a row, let's say you mow because the invasives are the first one that come up just in the spring. Okay. So that was something that they said that could potentially keep the invasives back the first three years. They're the first ones to sprout up. Um, that's something else to consider instead of just stop. But I have problems with all kinds of invasives, still grass. I, I mean, I just pick out as many as I can. Unfortunately, when you stop mowing, those are the first ones to come in. Right. Well, the, the, the Japanese still grass, yeah. after five years, I finally uh, removed it from my property. And wow. <laughs> I, I had a whole, whole side of it. And uh, of course, none of you will be happy to know that I use Roundup to get rid of it. But oh, uh, don't even uh, bring it, that up, Bill, it's not in this meeting. Well, you know, that's exactly what was recommended to me. Oh. It was recommended mowing, applying herbicide, mowing, applying herbicide, and doing that for like three years. And, and then and finally pull, and pulling it up a lot wherever yeah. I saw it and not letting it get to seed, uh, which is the main yeah. reason you should have mowed it down a month or so ago uh, this fall. Uh, but uh, so when I see it pop up, I pull it up now, but uh, finally eliminate it. But, you know, it's right on the other side of the property line. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I Never did the same joy. thing though. I just pulled it up by the roots and that was the only way to do it. And the only other thing I did was pull it up and then I aerated and bought some really expensive seed and put it over the top of it. And it did work, but you have it is timing, absolutely timing. Yeah. So last year I did it in the spring, or I did it in the spring just before germination, and I had also done it in the fall just before everything was starting to stop regrowing and then that worked. But it is hard because my neighbors, they use landscapers and as soon as I get rid of it, it just comes right back. Well, the, the vinca seems to uh, keep it down a bit. So if you can establish some vinca uh, and just pick it up when it comes up through the vinca, you can kind of get it under control, but. Is that a joke? So, uh, uh, Megan, do you um, want to continue? So we can sure, I can finish up. I can finish up. I love no, this conversation. We definitely have uh, engaged uh, people here. That's great. That's great. I just wanted to make sure that everyone had some good uh, resources. I don't know, Jennifer, if we can bring back up the uh, the PowerPoint. Just some resources and you know how to move forward. Like I said, I know a lot of you already have a lot of experience um, planting gardens and 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 working with invasives and attracting butterflies to your uh, to your garden. Um, but again, I wanted to bring up the Plant Nova Natives website again. Um, you know, just as we were talking about in this conversations, they have resource on on invasives and how to get rid of invasives. Um, another resource um, that I mentioned is uh, the Audubon at Home program. Uh, many of you may be familiar with it, but you get a free consultation. You know, it's, I found it to be an outstanding program. You can go online, they have their application and on their application, it's basically a checklist of what you need to be, what you need to do to become a wildlife sanctuary. And that's what I did. And one by one, I just tried to, you know, go through those, um, different items and then contact someone and they'll actually come out and, you know, he helped me really strategize on the best way to um, make it the best habitat. Um, so yeah, that's a second point there. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and the gentleman who came out was so helpful and really encouraging. And then you just fill in your application and um, 
it's an outstanding, outstanding program and following all their suggestions. You know, I have songbirds. I asked my husband, I was like, did I just never notice these before? Cause there's so many of them. I mean, the chickadees and the tip mice and the nut hatches and the bluebirds. And I mean, it's just been absolutely incredible to see the transition. Um, and then I find this last point, but I do want to make it somewhat elusive. This is a rolling grant. You guys are probably familiar with it also. The Virginia Conservation Assistance Program um, for HOAs and for private landowners, but they help in the uh, restoration of these resource uh, protection areas. I believe that the rolling uh, grant is closed for this year, um, but they do have monies. They refund up to 75 percent of projects. So I encourage you to look at that um, also. I think that there's one more slide here. Just a reminder that uh, the Plant Nova natives this week, both tomorrow morning and Thursday morning, have conferences um, so that you can get extra assistance from experts on how to get started with native plants. Um, they sell, um, you can download it for free, but there's actually a native plant guide. This one that you see here, the native plants for Northern Virginia, it's $5 if you want a hard copy. Um, and then you can also purchase signs. Um, I don't know if you guys recognize this logo, but like I said, Meadow Farms Nursery, um, they worked with this campaign and now have a separate section just for natives. And they've laid, labeled them in these, uh, with these signs. Uh, we had a campaign in place to start that with POTS on the pike uh, in spring. And I was all set to uh, sticker the native plants. And unfortunately, um, several things come up and I wasn't able to do that. But working with nurseries and getting native plants labeled in nurseries and kind of getting their own section is one of the big part of this campaign. Um, so that was it for me. Um, you guys were uh, very attentive. I, I wasn't expecting such a, a decent sized group. So thank you. And I, I am um, probably available for the next 10 minutes or so before I have to go put my four year old to sleep um to answer or chit chat at all I do want to encourage um if any of you are on Instagram uh I do have cultivate nature is my handle and I actually documented the conversion that I did from the lawn to the native plant garden there's hundreds of photos um and if not if you don't have Instagram or if you do uh, like I said in the springtime I am hoping to open up our garden to visit so you know to exchange ideas and whatnot so please think of me in the springtime hopefully everything will have you know and when I I say spring you know here I mean more May June right that's more what I mean May June because that's when the garden <laughs> starts so if there was any other questions or comments oh I'm sure there are we have to get back on the I, I, I just make a comment about that that um, uh, around here when we have a um, subdivision being built mm -hmm. or some type of construction uh, is often an opportunity for us to go in and actually rescue certain plants uh, that otherwise would be totally obliterated and sent to the dump. So um, actually the garden club, uh, uh, we worked uh, with the garden club when there was a subdivision coming in soon, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, removal of jack in the pulpits, uh, all types of ferns, all of which were gonna be paved over. And wow. uh, the garden, garden club worked with their members and had those removed. Um, there is a new senior assisted living home that's going to be built down across from Dante's. Um, GFCA has worked very closely with the owners, the new owners of that property. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, native tree saplings in there. There's sumac. Um, and if anyone is interested in that, or if the Environment and Parks Committee would like to sponsor a visit, uh, I can get permission easily from the owners who are going to obviously remove most of that to build the building. So um, these are just nice opportunities to get native plants that otherwise, if you wanted a native sumac, where would you get it? Well, there's plenty of them there if you have a big shovel <laughs> and want to bring it home. So uh, that's just an opportunity I'd mentioned to you, Megan, or any of the other folks on the phone. We can, um, we can do that because construction probably won't start for another few months. Thank you. Could I ask about the free plant ID app, Megan, that you had on the slide, but I didn't see the actual app. Yeah, no. the app wasn't on the slide. I was just mentioning that it's on their website. So if you go to plantnovanatives.org, um, you don't have it up there. Um, 
I'll be honest with you, I actually haven't used it, um, but I know that for um, beginners and trying to figure out what plants go well together and what plants do best in the conditions that you have, I've heard it's a really great search tool. Uh, but like I said, go ahead and go to their website and check it out and tell me how it goes. You know, I haven't gotten into very many ID apps. Does anyone use iNaturalist? iNaturalist, no. No. Okay. So I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting more accustomed to some of these ID um, applications though. I, I used I bought one it. recently. I don't have my phone in my hand, but um, yeah. it's great. You really? take a picture of the plant it tells you what it is, all about it. And I mean, I, I'm, it's a whole new world. I, I've never experienced that before just in the last few months. Do you have to pay for it? No, it's free. And you don't remember the name? Uh, let me get my phone. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jennifer. That's so nice. So this is, yeah, this is the Native Plant Finder app on their website. That was so nice of you, Jennifer. It was very thoughtful. Um, and then the one that Chris is mentioning may be the one called the iNaturalist. That's the other one I know. Um, okay. The perfect Northern Virginia plant for your space. I love it for your planting needs. It's like having it. It's like having a botanist in your back pocket. What a treat. I use an app called Seek, S-E-E-K, oh. and you just take a picture of the plant, or I identified an insect last week on my window. Uh, if you can get a good picture of the insect, and it tells you what it is instantly. Seek. Okay, I gotta write Seek. I'm learning it's all a, these things. This is great. S-E-E-K, right. It's a, it's, a free, it's a free app download, so. Okay. I suppose if you got a good picture of a bird, uh, it might tell you that too, but that's a little harder, right? Yeah. <laughs> I've used it too, Bill. Does it work with stars or planets? The one I have is called Picture This. Oh, there's so many. Picture This, and it works beautifully. You just take a picture of the um, of the plant as long as it's in focus and it's reasonably close and tells you pages of information about that plant. And I, I, I use Plant Snap, Plant Snap. Yeah, similar. Cool. Take a picture of the plant, tell yeah. you what it is. Fun. You guys are so technologically savvy. I love it. When could, I, could I just say on the VCAP program oh, yeah. that you made? Yes, yes. Uh, my neighbor here uh, uh, was, uh, was grant, received a grant. He decided not to go through with it, but uh, he was granted $16,000 to spend. Um, in, including he was in the process of replacing his extensive driveway. So it would have involved uh, creating a, a pervious driveway. And uh, that may be factor in the dollar value, but uh, uh, it's, it's worth looking into the program. Great, thank you. Karen, did you wanna say something? I just wanted to say uh, in um, response to uh, Megan and also Anna earlier, who I don't know, um, but if you want to go uh, a slightly less, um, you know, difficult uh, route uh, than, you know, the whole cardboard and all that uh, in your backyard. I, I'm also at you know, my house is in between lots of really nice and green lawns. But when I moved back to Great Falls, um, like five, six years ago now, um, I did. I decided I wasn't going to put any pesticides or uh, you know any anything like that on on my uh, lawn. And um, in the back, what I have done uh, is I've planted uh, a bunch of trees where we just had lawn. Um, you know, so I've done that. But then the other thing is this spring we actually had Meadows Farms come out and rip up some sod a bunch of sod um, to make a pollinator uh, garden out there of mostly over our septic system. And I actually investigated that with the county um, and it, it's, it's pretty big. So they ripped out the sod and then we put in a lot of um, native uh, flowering plants. And, uh, and then, so then the grass that we have left, we still have it left, you know, we're getting, we have a lot of, um, you know, Japanese stilt weed too, but we just mow it. And I just tell my husband, ignore how ugly and brown it looks now. And, you know, we're just, so it, it's kind of ugly where the lawn, you know, it, it still has lawn there in parts, but it, it's kind of a compromise. Um, so, 
you know, I still think it makes it look more country-ish out there as opposed to manicured. And, and I like it better. And I tell you, we have so many birds and butterflies and uh, they, I don't see them on the lawns next door. You know, I think they know. Uh, so anyway. That's so great. I do think starting small is a road to success. I mean, if you if you start too big, you get frustrated. So I do think starting small is, is, is great. Thank you. I do want to take this time. I want to thank you guys so much. I do have to go. Um, like I said, this was a total honor. I mean, this is a great audience and I've been wanting to get my message out. So Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Please keep my contact. Um, my email should be on the information I sent. So thank you so much. Good night.